Dobry Państwu. Good morning. Welcome to uh, the Faculty of Physics, University of Warsaw Colloquium. And uh, today, as you saw, the title is provocative. That means much more interesting. As a guest and a lecturer, we have Professor Leszek Olgiert Zasztoft from um, University of Warsaw, Faculty of Oriental Studies, Center for uh, East European Studies, who is a specialist in history of Central and Eastern Europe and Russia, an author of numerous books on that. Um, as an interesting detail, which I found in internet, question is if professor will uh, approve and confirm it, he's Samogitian himself, in Polish, Zmudzin, at least with Samogitian roots. And last summer, he has been awarded a Knight Cross of the Order of Merits for Lithuania by Lithuanian president in Vilnius, which is a great honor. This is an honor for us and pleasure to have professor with us. And we hope for a fantastic lecture by a top specialist in the subject. Professor Zastov, the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, I start from the people who are not from Poland to uh, explain that Ukraine has a very significant place in Polish minds, in Polish, let's say, culture. And probably the most popular song which you can uh, hear of every, on the every wedding in Poland is uh, Hey, Hey, Sokoły. So this is the Polish uh, lines of this, uh, this song. And here you have some uh, translation into English. So uh, to get you, the, to give you the, 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 a taste of the atmosphere is how somewhere over, hey, somewhere over the black water, a young Cossack is getting on the horse. He tenderly beats farewell to the girl, even more tender with Ukraine. And so on, so on. Regret, regret for the girl, for green Ukraine. Regret, regret, hearts cries. I will never see her again. Wine, 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 give me. And when I die, bury me in green Ukraine with my beloved girl. So you can feel the, the sentiment, the, the, the atmosphere of the song. It's, it's very popular in Poland. It's of course, it's, it's version is also in Ukrainian, <clears throat> but in Poland it's probably one of the most popular songs on, on concerning Ukraine. 
So everything what I'm going to talk here is, uh, is connected with sentiments. So it's absolutely opposite to physics, to, the, to chemistry, to mathematics. So there's more about the climate, about the, about the feelings, about the atmosphere, about the something in the air which cannot be defined in, let's say, mathematical terms. And the main <coughs> questions which I'm going to ask are here. Why Russia considers Ukraine as an integral part of its empire? Why Ukraine does not want to be part of the Russian empire and of so-called Russian Mir, Ruski Mir, Russian world? Why do Ukrainians consider themselves U Europeans and closer to Europe than to Russia? Why do Poles support Ukraine and help Ukrainians and Ukraine? Can the former Polish-Lithuanian uh, Polish Ukrainian community and friendship be reborn due to the Russia, Russia's aggression to the Ukraine. So these are the questions which I'm going to try to answer during this uh, uh, presentation. Of course, we have to start from the moment which is probably the most important for uh, all the, the people of the former Eastern Bloc, so from the USSR period. So the Soviet legacy and the Soviet and the longing for the Soviet, uh, let's say, civilization is still was still visible in former uh, Soviet republics, including Ukraine. So I remember the situations somewhere in Donetsk a few years bef before the aggression of, of on Crimea, that I met one man in a dormitory of Kharkov of, of Donetsk University, and he said. You know, I have never been uh, um, over the borders. I have never crossed the frontier of, po of Ukraine and, and West. So he, all his life he spent on the, in Ukraine. So, <clears throat> so there, is, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of sympathy and sentiment to Soviet times also in Ukraine, and ex exactly and especially particularly on the east of Ukraine. So on this belt, which, is, which comes from Donetsk, Kugansk, and um, let's say uh, northern part, uh, coast or shore of the Black Sea, of course, yeah, on Azov. So longing and legacy of Soviet Union is still, was still visible till the beginning of the war on January 24th. So uh, this is the, the state, just to recall you, to remind you how it looked, but even on the Soviet, Maps you can see here that that some regions were separated. As you can see here, Ukraine, Belarus, and, and so-called Baltic states were uh, were separated from this uh, state. I don't know why here, but okay. So, so let's start from the general information. Soviet Ukraine existed since 1917-1918, because there were few, exactly three Ukrainian independent states in the short period after the First World War, since 1918 till 1919, so called uh, Ukrainska Narodna Republika, so Ukrainian People's Republic, but later that was also Soviet, Soviet uh, Republic of Ukraine, which existed for 74 four years and was de facto the, the first, the first Ukrainian state, uh, let's say, acknowledged by the international community. And uh, so this is quite important information to, to, uh, to have it in, in our minds that the first long lasted Ukrainian state was the Soviet state. That's why the Soviet uh, legacy was so important. Okay, uh, some term terminology uh, or terminological issues which I have to explain at the beginning. Uh, you we have to remember that in general, Russia is not Ukraine, Ukraine is not Russia. Russia in historical terms is Moscow, Moscow Dachy, Moscovy or Muscovy, Grand or Great Rush, and then Russia. So the problem lies where in English terminology, because Russia is very often Rush, Polish word Rush or Ukrainian and Russian word Rush is translated into English as Russia. It's not correct because <clears throat> Russia is Russia. 
And Rush is not Russia. Rush, Russia is only a part of whole ancient Rush because Rush was Ukraine. Rutenia, this is a classical Latin term for Ukraine, which you can find on the old maps. Rutenia, that's equal with Rush, and then Ukraine. Ukraine name was first, um, first uh, introduced to the literature probably around 15th, 16th century in the, in the Lithuanian statutes. So the beginning, beginning 1559, 1529 probably, in the first Lithuanian status or, or even earlier. Uh, of course, uh, then Ukraine dominated. And uh, so you must remember that uh, Ukraine is not Russia and Russia is not Ukraine. Um, and even preparing this lecture, I found such a thing in the internet, which was for the Western uh, viewer, the map prepared for the Western viewer to show the difference between Russia, because every, everyone equals Russia and Soviet Union. And Russia and Soviet Union is not the same. Russia is only part of the Soviet Union, the biggest one, but still only one. So here is such a comic, a bit comic or satirical drawing showing what's Russia, what's not Russia. And the main thing connected with Ukraine coming to the problem of Ukraine is the division. Because Ukraine, in fact, might be divided in at least, in my opinion, eight or 10 parts which are different. I'm not going to go deeper in this pro to, to problems, what, what part of Ukraine is that or that. I think that 10 or even more. I will later I'll show you some of those parts of Ukraine. But main line of division is Dnieper River. So when you see here on the map, this is Dnieper River, which is the main river uh, crossing uh, Ukraine in the middle. And of course, Kiev is on uh, the settled on the both banks of the key of the Dnieper River. And what is in Ukraine on the left bank, so here, here left bank here, that's the, the way, the, the territory where the war is now, here, and Kherson is now also in, in the fire. So this is left bank Ukraine, and here is right bank Ukraine. Here is on the other map, right bank Ukraine, left bank Ukraine. On the right bank Ukraine, that was part of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania after a collapse of the Kievian Rush, um, erected by Saint Vladimir. I get back to it in a moment. And later it started to be a part of uh, Kingdom of Poland and of Crown. So this right bank Ukraine was a part, in fact, a part of Poland or Poland-Lithuania Commonwealth. Probably it's better to call it Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth or Polish Lithuanian Republic than to call it Poland, Poland as in the 19th century historiography, because that wasn't Poland, in fact. This was an ethnical Poland, but it was a part of the Kingdom of Poland. When the left bank Ukraine was the part of the Russian Empire since the midst of the 17th century. So this, uh, this is also Zaporozhye here. Uh, I later show you also the regions. The, probably the most important element from the, at the start in the Middle Ages was the conquest, the conquest of Muscovy by the Mongols. So Mongols rule in the uh, state of Muscovy or Duchy of Muscovy or Principality of Muscovy since 13th century to uh, 14th century, started in 1223, Battle of Kauka and ended more or less around around 1380, Battle of Kulikove Pole. Uh, then the important, after the, the, let's say, putting out this, what they call it, uh, the Mongol uh, rule, the Mongol, hmm, I forgot the Russian name of that, that moment, but uh, hmm, uh, they start to rebuild, reborn, uh, and refurbish the, the Grand Duchy of Moscow. And it's finally at the beginning of the 18th century started to be an empire. So Russian empire started from the uh, period of reign of Peter the Great, who died, died in 1725. That was this uh, territory, which you can see here on this map. So as you can see, the whole Finland was included as a grand duchy of Finland since 1809. 
that was a, not say not exactly the part of the empire, but uh, the same as a kingdom of Poland here with Warsaw. That was satellite state connected with the empire, but of course the Russian garrisons had their settlements here and here. So that were, and that, that and we can exactly get when the map was made. So that was after 1809 when Finland was incorporated. And that was of course, uh, surely after 1815 when the kingdom of Poland was created. But that was before 1870s because the central as the Asian uh, gubernias were, uh, were catched by Russian empire um, in the more or less around 1870. So that map was made because it's the English version around between 1809, 1870, 1870. And here on the right, you have the, the coat of arms of the Russian empire with all provinces. Here we have the St. George on the horse killing a dragon. And of course we have here even the white eagle. That's the, the coat of arms of the kingdom of Poland with Warsaw. Uh, so the problem lies in what? That in the Russian historiography, uh, Kievian Rus, so the state, which I mentioned in a moment, more information, uh, was the beginning of, the, of, the, of Russia. So Russia considers Kievian Rus as the beginning of its history. So St. Vladimir, which you can see in the right corner, was the creator not only of Kievian Rus, but also of uh, Moscow Rus of Russia. When Ukrainian historians consider Kievian Rus as a, Ukraine, correctly, because territorially it's very close to, and is considered uh, for its beginnings as exclusively the beginning of the Ukrainian history. So at the, at the starting point, the Russian narrative goes from St. Vladimir to Moscow, and the Ukrainian uh, narrative starts in Kiev and stays in Kiev, moving nowhere. So, so, and this is also the, the problem of quarrel between, uh, let's say, who, um, humanist uh, researchers in Russia and Ukraine. So, so Vladimir, the creator of Rush, here on the icon, uh, is by both nations, both states, uh, acknowledged as uh, the creator of their states. Um, in history of Russia, the moment when this uh, Mongol invasion uh, ended, that's the uh, starting point of the so-called embracing of the Slavic, uh, old Slavic principalities surrounding Moscow. And on this map, you can see so something which is called, which is called uh, uh, golden uh, ring. So there were the principalities around Moscow, which the, they started to. Um, subordinate to Moscow, and then uh, the same uh, political ideology go to, uh, went to uh, to subordinate Belarus, Ukraine, and all Slavic uh, Slavic lands. So here you can see, uh, of course, this is the you can see that the no, Novgorod Republic here. There is a Grand Duchy of Lithuania here. Of course, here is uh, crown the kingdom of Poland, and this is Moscow. So this is Moscow principality, uh, but also, so you can see that, that there were a lot of small organisms uh, which, which were uh, subordinated to Moscow more or less. But before that started, that was the Kievian Rus, and Kievian Rus was independent and very powerful state for over the, uh, 30, uh, 350, years since 1862 till 1240 and uh, we have to remember which is not very often information not very popular in polish historiography that our piast dynasty imported the, the vikings not only from uh, scandinavia i'm speaking about mieszko and uh, about boleslaw chorobry they imported the vikings from kiev and the latest archaeological excavation in Poland, done more or less with 
by Institute of Polish Academy, Institute of Kultury Materialnej, now it's Institute of Archaeology and Ethnology of Polish Academy of Sciences, with a Professor Buko as its former di di director. They found that first generation of, uh, of knights uh, who were on the let's say, in service of Hrobry and his brother were from Scandinavia because of genetic researchers uh, co comparing the uh, remnants in Scandinavia and in Poland. And then uh, the second generation, or because they found the, the cementaries. Uh, and third generation were imported from Kiev. So they were also Vikings, but they were Viking from Kiev because from gen genetical, let's say, uh, picture we can read. So uh, Kievian Rus in one moment uh, embraced every, nearly everything. As you can see on this map, that was a lot of Grand Rus, also territories, uh, to the north, because we have to remember that the Russians always were called the North tribes, the North nation, because, uh, and in fact, uh, thanks to the latest, uh, let's say, genetical research, we can uh, say that when you genotype, when you, let's say, when you read the genotype of Russians, they have more elements similar to this Eugrophenic population on the north belt of uh, European Russia and Asiatic Russia than uh, the Slavic genotype. The most Slavic genotype is in Belarusians and also in Poles. Poles are the most, uh, let's say, clear Slavic nations from the genotype point of view which is not well known. Um, so, uh, of course, there were the territories which were, uh, the, let's say, the problem for Kievian Rus and also for Kingdom of Poland. And the most uh, renowned is disputed territories between Ukraine, Kiev, Rutenia, and Kingdom of Poland were the so-called Czerwian castles or Grody Czerwieńskie. So this is today's Przemyśl, uh, Lesko, uh, and surroundings. Sometimes those, uh, the borders of those Czerwien uh, castles is, is enlarged to including Lwów, because in fact Lwów, or Lviv was on the border. So on, on certain maps, we can find also Lwów or Lviv as a town in Czerwien. So then uh, Ukraine came under the rule of Grand Duchy of Lithuania with the, uh, with the capital in Vilnius and was right bank and central, was part of Grand Duchy of Lithuania from 13th century for, over, for more or less 350 years, then started in 1569, the part of the Kingdom of Poland. So this is the, these are the borders of the, of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. So when you hear uh, information that Poland once upon a time had its borders settled on north on the uh, Baltic Sea and on the south on the, on the shore of the Black Sea, you must remember that that is very difficult to find such a moment in the history of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. In fact, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania settled its northern borders on Baltic Sea and southern borders on the Black Sea. But later, when this Ukrainian territory started to be a part of the Kingdom of Poland, there was, there was no, let's say, straight connection with the, with the northern shore of the, of the Black Sea. And of course, uh, those territories on, seen here as a yellow, these were uh, lost, not from Poland, but from, from uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania to Russia, to, to Moscow. In fact, that embraced the Smolensk, uh, Smolensk region and later some regions on the south. I'm not going to, to explain in details all those things. And then after the Union of Lublin in 1569, uh, Ukraine Central and Western started to be of a part of the Polish-Lithuanian Republic, of course, in the, of, of the Kingdom of Poland um, uh, for over 20 years, still the partitions, still the partitions 70, 72, 1795. 
after the divisions, uh, the division started in general, not in the 18th century, but in fact, in the midst of the 17th century. And here on this map, you have the three treaties uh, of Andrushov uh, of 1667, when the Eastern territories uh, were lost, partly from Lithuania and partly from Poland. Uh, those from Poland, that was Ukraine, uh, were lost for, uh, to Russia, which started in the moment to be an empire. And that was the moment when the Kiev lost his uh, connections with, with the Kingdom of Poland and started to be part of, of Russia. Mm. Of course, after the partitions, we, might, we have to remember that some uh, territories of Ukraine, just a moment, as here, that's Eastern Galicia, that's Galicia, and that's Eastern Galicia, with Lvov as a capital of the whole creature, or all Galicia was, uh, the capital of all Galicia was, was Lvov or Lviv. Uh, that was part of Austria and then Austro-Hungary. Um, there were, there was a, a Ukrainian state even after the midst of the 17th century. The problem with the state is called the Cossack Hetmanate. The problem with the state, this is the map from the 1740, 1750. The problem is that uh, this state was very much uh, subordinated to the Russian empire. So uh, in spite that the, its administrative judicial, judicial system persisted until 1782, the, uh, the, let's say, the real independence of Hetmanite state is a very disputable thing. But it started with this gentleman, you remember, probably Bogdan Zinovi Chmielnicki, who was the uh, creator of the first huge uh, Cossack uprising against Rzeczpospolita, against, uh, against Poland Lithuania um, in the 1648. And he was the first hetman, for, first chief of the Ukrainian state. And then, after the, he died later in the second half of the 50s, oh no, in 1657, as far. Yeah, so uh, it's written here. So, uh, uh, so uh, we had other headmans. For example, the, well, the best known are Philip Orlik or Philip Orwick. I call, I call him a constitution man because he prepared the first, more or less, something substitute of the constitution for, for Ukraine. Now his diaries were published by Professor Valentina Sobol. And the most renowned is, of course, Ivan Mazepa. Swabatsky wrote about Mazepa, who was the, the supporter of the Swedish king in fight with Peter the Great during the Northern War, 1721. Uh, uh, and uh, he had to run out to Turkey and then ended his life in 1709. And then were uh, other uh, hetmans were, but in, uh, uh, let's say, hetmanat, Zaporozhye, uh, who were subordinated to Russian imper imperial reigns. So, for example, uh, Kirill or Cyril Razumovsky was the last hetman of Ukraine. His brother was a lover of Catherine the Great, his brother. And of course, uh, he was totally, uh, let's say, russified person living in Petersburg speaking only Russian and not feeling the Ukrainian, let's say, um, roots. The problem is of the territory and scale, scale of the territory and, and the scale of wealth. And we have, I have to, <clears throat> I'm not going to discuss this problem in, in, in particular details, but we must remember that Ukraine is huge, is still huge. Comparing to Russia, of course, is not as huge as we can as Russia, but comparing to other uh, European peninsula uh, state organism, Ukra Ukraine is huge. And Ukraine, on the second information, has a beautiful, fantastic soil, the black soil. So uh, the agriculture was the main. Uh, starting point for the for the wealth of this country. So who holds Ukraine on? holds the money, holds the, the 
income from agriculture. And of course, this huge territories because there is a lot of minerals and so on and so on. So the, there were many reasons for Moscow and many reasons for Poland to have Ukraine under its own, let's say, shoe. During the uh, Polish or Polish-Lithuanian rule, there were some voyevodships. Uh, the most we know, of course, was Ruthenian voyevodship. Here is the coat of arm of the Polish period and of the Russian period, of the Austrian period, because this was part of Austria after the partitions. And uh, during the Austrian period, uh, with this crow, crow here, um, uh, this uh, uh, the official name of the country was the Kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria with the Duchy of uh, Auschwitz and Zator. So that was the official name of Galicia. And this coat of arm is the official coat of arm of Habsburg Empire of Kingdom of Galicia. So you can see the clothes crown. That's imperial crown. Yeah, when the crown is open, that's king's crown. When the crown is closed, that's imperial crown. And, and those three, that's provinces. And so that's the, the coat of arm of coat of arms of Galicia, which was part of Austria and Austro-Hungary. But this, I'm going further, Volenian voyevodship, Volin in Polish, in 1566, attached to the crown in the same of Lublin. And here also the coat of arm of, from the Polish period of Volinia and coat of arm of Gubernia Volinijska of the Russian one. And the same in other provinces. Podolia Voyevodship created in 1436 from the lands of Podolia annexed to the King of Poland. So before even Lublin. And, still, and here we have the coat of arm of, from the Polish period. And here, the coat of arm from the Imperial Russian period. So the same, exactly the sun, uh, very similar. The biggest one was the Ki Kiev voyevodship. And in fact, we, I should mention that the Kiev voyevodship was very often in all sources um, um, described as Ukraine. So when you, in all, in all sources, historical sources, when you read about Ukraine, you, you might be sure till the 18th century, more or less, that they are talking about the Kiev voyevodship because the other provinces were Podolia, Volinia, Podole, Wołyn, and these were absolutely different. That was not Ukraine. Ukraine was a Kiev. And here, the, why this is important, is the Archangel Michael, the coat of arm of the, uh, of the Kiev capital. But you must remember that this is also the coat of arm of Ukraine now. I will show you in a moment. So we have the Archangel uh, St. Michael, coat of arms of Ukraine, named St. Archangel, Archangel St. Michael, the Archistrategos, uh, general chief in the ancient Greece, welding a flaming sword and a shield on the laser field. And of course, we have here the other symbol Ukrainian, here Archangel Michael and this trident. Trident, it came to the Ukrainian tradition from the uh, very early Middle Ages. So that's nothing in, uh, with Ukrainian UPA, so Ukrainian National Army or Ukrainian Nationalist Organization. That's old, medieval, very similar, by the way, trident is in the, in the Lithuanian tradition where you have uh, also trident, a bit different, not so, let's say, ornamental, uh, ornamentally worked. Uh, so that is, uh, Trident in Lithuania is called the Gedimin Trident. So these tridents are connected with the pagan tradition from the very early Middle Ages. Chernikov Voivodship, who later lost also to Russia. You can see here on the, that's from the Polish period, double head Polish eagle. And here is from the, uh, from the, uh, Russians decided to cut one head. Why? Because the original coat of arms of the Russian Empire is the double head eagle. So they could not have Chernikov province with a double head and the, the state coat of arm with a double head. So they cut one head in Chernikov of the eagle. 
And let me go further. Bratslav, Bratslav Voyevodship, uh, that was the border Voyevodship uh, very often in the hands of Turks. So we have here, uh, of course, the half moon in the period, Polish period. That was in the hands of Turks very long since the beginning of the 16th century till the beginning of the, of the 17th century or nearly 100 years. And here is the Russian uh, coat of arm of Bratislav province. And this I found to leave those administrative divisions and those codes of arms, and this I found in the internet. That's uh, how the Russian propaganda wants to show you, because they, at the beginning, uh, say that there was no Ukrainian state, there is no Ukrainian nation, there is no separate Ukrainian culture, there is no separate Ukrainian folk behaviors and so on and so on. So there is nothing Ukrainian. Everything was Ukrainian. That's so-called small Russian or little or lesser La Russia. So there, is, there are no Ukrainians, there are lesser, lesser little Russians. So, uh, and the language, uh, Ukrainian language is not a language, it's a focal dialect of the great literary Russian language. So we have, uh, uh, let's say, the language of Pushkin, of Lermontov, of many others. And then we have this, let's say, uh, handicapped, catastrophic folk country, simple and stupid Ukrainian language. So that's the approach of Russians to Ukrainian language. So when you look at, the, I found it internet. That's, of course, everything what you can see on this map is, is, is false, it's fake news because they said that this was only the Ukrainian state in 1654, that's not true. Then this one is of course uh, given to, uh, by Lenin in 1922 to Ukrainian state. Uh, of course, this was also the gift of the Russian Tsars uh, in the 1654 till 1917. And this of course was Stalin because Stalin in fact uh, included Lvov and Galicia, Eastern Galicia in the borders of Soviet Union and Ukrainian People's Socialist Republic. So this is what Russians are doing to show you that there is nothing such a thing, no such a thing as Ukraine. And those, in some way, of course, these divisions are correct because the, these are, of course, the different regions of Ukraine. But as we know, they are, they are not Russians and, they, and, and this is not Russia. And now is some information about this ter territories. During the uh, Imperial Russia, for example, the Crimea uh, governorate or gubernia was called Tavritska gubernia, uh, Taurida. Taurida, that's also the peninsula of Crimea. So, uh, so that was that was. And this here is the coat of arms of Crimea during from the from the. Uh, period of Russian Empire. And you must remember when Russians are telling you that Crimea is a part and was a part of Russia from the very, its very beginning is of course fake news because the Crimea was annexed by Russia in 1780s, exactly more or less after the first partition of Poland and Lithuania before the second one. So that was the moment when Crimea was annexed by uh, by Russians, by Russian Empire. And before that was the uh, separate state of Khanat of uh, Tartars uh, governed or reigned by, by the dynasty of Girey or Girey. So the, there is a lot of Tartars from Crimea who has the surname Girey. That's, that's the name of the dynasty which created the, the independent Khanat of Crimea. Then, then we have the Kherson uh, gubernia. Here you have information when it was also the coat of arms. I'm not going to the Yekaterinosov uh, gubernia, which is quite important, uh, called also very often Novorossia. And uh, that was uh, during uh, the Catherine the Great, uh, um, when she was um, uh, settled on the throne, that was first Novorossiysk governorate, 1764-1783, then second, 
and uh, later was divided in th into three parts, Kherson, Gubernia, Taurida, and Yekaterinoslavskaya. And this is very important that on this territory here, that was in the midst of the 18th century, it was called New Serbia. New Serbia, why? Because the um, uh, refugee from Balkans, from Serbia mostly, were settled on this so-called Pustostani, because there was a steppe and there was no, no, not much people, not many people. And of course, there were uh, very good soil. So there were uh, the settlements of the emigrants or refugees from, from Serbia, not only from Serbia, from other also Balkan states. But later, the chief of those people, whose name was Horvat, so it's very strange because he was a Serb and the name was Horvat. He was accused for, for some, let's say, uh, criminal and financial uh, um, uh, things. And the, the, the new Serbia was dissolved. So going further and coming to slowly to the end. Uh, the divisions, uh, there is the idea in Russia that because Ukrainians are Orthodox, they are very close brothers of Russians, or as I said, they are exactly the same as Russians. So the, the Orthodoxy, the Greek faith, in fact, they I think that this is the only true one, is uh, the base of this the Russian theory that Ukrainians and Russians are one. But of course, you must remember that we have also the Polish, the people, the Poles who are Orthodox. Of course, the big part of Belarusians are Orthodox. We can, you can find Orthodox people in Finland, in Latvia, in Estonia, also not Slavic people, but Orthodox. The other next element, the alphabet Cyrillic, which, which is of course the same in Ukraine and in Russia. And this something very difficult to define, a Slavicness, um, is considered by uh, Slavicness, of course, of, of Ukrainians and Russians, is considered by Moscow, Russia as a unifying factor. That's uh, for a short uh, re recalling uh, the situation which was before the Second World War in, or even before the partitions, the, the commonwealth of many religions. And these are the religions and the end of the 16th century. And on the left in the rose color, you can see the Catholics on the green color. These are pro Orthodox people. We had, of course, a lot of Lutherans, so Evangelic, Augsburgian denomination, and other Protestants, for example, Calvinists. But of course, we had also uh, Armenians, we had Jews, Karayats. Muslims and others. So, but once the statement is very important that when you compare the number of population of Poland, Lithuania at the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century, there was more or less 50 50, 50 Latin. Christianity, 50 Greek Kashtan. So, so the orthodoxy uh, embraced more or less around 50% of the total population of Poland Lithuania. We don't remember now about that, that each person on this territory before the partitions, each second was was Orthodox. Uh, how it looks today? You know, this looks today like you can see. That's just, just to recall the situation. In the, as deeper is the red color, going to feel of purple, then the number of, of course, of Orthodox is bigger. That's how Cyrillic alphabet looks today also, because as you know, Kazakhstan here is uh, losing Cyrillic alphabet and going to Latin. So they get back with the Kazakh language to, to Latin alphabet. Uh, Slavic countries today, just a short, Panorama of this. And we have to remember that the, the metropol, met, metropol, metropolis of the Orthodoxy was Kiev. And Kiev was the capital for, of the Eastern European Orthodoxy till 1458. Then it moved to Moscow, but not straight. I didn't show it on this slide, but 
the let's say neighboring town was uh, Vladimir on Kla upon Klazma. So the capital of orthodoxy was moved from Kiev to the uh, Vladimir upon Klazma, and after a few years, taken from Vladimir upon Klazma to Moscow. So, so why I'm, I'm let's say, I'm underlining this situation, just to remember that the, from the point of view of historical sources, Kiev is more ancient capital of the Orthodoxy than Moscow, because the oldest one was in Kiev, not in Moscow. And one information, which is probably, you know, the, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church was founded not so long ago, on December 15, 2018, as a result of the Unifical Unification Council, which was held in the Cathedral of Wisdom of God in Kiev. That's the moment of uh, division of, let's say, uh, coming out of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church from the Russian, Russian Orthodox Church with a patriarchate in Moscow. And of course, the new, uh, new patriarch of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church uh, um, is uh, Bishop Epiphanius. He is, the, for Ukrainians, the most important. And, and probably yesterday, you, we heard the information in the TV that during the uh, Orthodox uh, uh, Christmas, Christmas, uh, the first time for the third 300 years, the mass in the Wawra Pieczerska, so the Pieczerska Lavra, the main, let's say, monastery in Kiev, which is huge, was uh, conducted by Epiphanius. So first of for 300 years. And you must remember that Ukrainian Częstochowa, which is uh, in Pochayev, in, in the right bank Ukraine, is still in the hands of Moscow Patriarchate. So they have a very strange situation that they have the war with Russia, but big part of the, of the believers of the orthodoxy in Ukraine belongs in fact to the Moscow Patriarch uh, Patriarchate. And you must remember that Kiev, the chief, the head of the Moscow Patriarchate is a close friend of, friend of Putin and he sacralize the tanks and the soldiers who are killing, killing Ukrainians. So the situation is absolutely mad. So let's go further. And there is how it looks on the map. That's less in Polish, but on the, on the top, on the blue, you can see the uh, parochial network of the Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church. And on the red, on the lower uh, map, you can see the map of the Moscow Patriarchate. So, so you can see how, how deep is the influence of Moscow orthodoxy in Ukraine still. Of course, there is a lot of uh, traditional sympathies or antipathies. Of course, that's from the period of revolution. Of course, this is the Polish pan here. That's Polish nobleman. And who is cutting, fighting this Polish nobleman? Ukrainian and Russian worker or, or farmer or peasant. So, uh, and of course the house, uh, the, the, the advertisement was Ukrainians and Russians are one clan. And uh, what's, and of course uh, they have to fight with the Polish master. Mm, that's of course is propaganda from the Soviet period, Bolshevik time. Russia was always was always the uh, the um, the threat for Europe. So you, when you look in the internet, you can find Russia in caricature, a lot of such a things like it, like here, Russia is Europe the terror state. Here is very often Russia here in 1914, creation of Europe, cart of Europe, in here. The other one from the uh, 1870s here by Russia, so like octopus. So Russia in general, not only in Ukraine, but all around the world is uh, considered as a country ruled by autocrats on the Byzantine model. And the question is, is it magnet or repulsive factor for Ukrainians? And now when we look at the history, we can find such a 
let's say flowers, as we can are used to say in Polish, beautiful flowers, present them in France, in Russia, served them until 1861, equal to slavery, poverty of peasants in Russia, in let's say Russia proper. So this Grand Moscow, Grand Russia. There was less poverty in Ukraine, you must remember. Just a moment. Just a moment. I'm, I'm somewhere too far. Oh, just a moment. I'm, I made some mistake. Sorry for the break. We're coming close to the end. And on the, on the opposite, we have this tradition of Cossack, Cossack state. And of course, the most renowned picture painting is the Zaporozhin's work, writing a letter to the Sultan. Uh, uh -huh, okay. By Ilya Ryepin, who was a Russian painter. Ilya Ryepin is one of the most famous Russian painters. And this is probably the most, the most renowned painting of Ilya Ryepin. I'm not going to discuss this scene here. But also in Polish tradition, we have a lot of, uh, in, let's say, visualization of, uh, of the Cossacks. Because Cossacks in Polish tradition are very brave people and very heroic people, heroic people, and very, let's say, uh, the people who should be supported. And of course, we have this 19th century tradition of showing, painting the U Ukrainian, Ruthenian Cossacks. And one of the most famous painter was Josef Brandt. That's wedding in Ukraine. What we can see on this picture, the freedom, liberty. They are free people on the steppe. They have no borders. They have no rules. They can do everything. That's something to love. Here, for example, of course, that's probably drunk Cossack but still he is free. He's a totally free, totally free man. Where we can find in Russia such a people? No, nowhere. So freedom is a priority for Ukrainians. This is also due to the Cossack tradition. I think that this Cossack tradition in Ukrainian history is even more important than they, even Ukrainian can, can expect because they all, of course, not every Ukrainian is a Cossack. But the, the same as not every police is a shlachtchit, is a nobleman. But we have this, uh, let's say, dominating trend that every pole is a pan, is, is shlachtchit. So even we, when you are from the farmer's peasant family, you have your coat of arm, you have your sebel, you have your, let's say, uh, grandfather on the portrait uh, over your bed. So this noble, noble tradition in Poland is still vivid. The same is in Ukraine with the Cossack tradition. They are still feel, feel themselves as a, as a, let's say, continuators of, of Cossacks. And let's look to the national anthem of Ukraine. I, I read the, some similar moments with the Polish national anthem. Ukraine is not dead yet and glory and freedom still to us. Young brothers, fate will smile. Our enemies will die like dew in the sun. We will rule brothers and we in our country. We will sacrifice our soul and body for our freedom. And we will show that we are brothers from a Cossack family. Hey, kind brothers, let's go, let's go to work. Let's, hey, it's time to get up. It's time to get that freedom. That's exactly like in Poland, the Polish national anthem. Jeszcze Polska nie zginęła. Szczenie zmarła Ukraina. So, so this, let's say, enormous and very deep uh, sense of liberty, which is visible in Polish nation, is also visible in Ukrainian nation. That's, what, that's why they are, cannot accept here is, of course, not Ukrainian in the middle, but probably Cherkis. And on the left is Russia, on the right is Britain. 
but but this that, that shows us this caricature the situation of Ukrainians too. And of course, the tradition you have here, in the name of uh, God, our freedom and your for our freedom and yours. So you have from the January uprising of 1863 on the left in Polish, in on the, from the same uprising, in in uh, let's say it's Cyrillic, the same the same. Vimia Boha, za naszą i waszą wolność. So. That's what, what I'm going to finish slowly. Ukraine as a country, you have to remember that Ukraine, Ukraine is a country of freedom and liberty. And those Cossacks are, let's say, deeply settled in this tradition. And we have to remember that uh, that caused also that uh, deep conviction of freedom, the hatred of Russians to Ukrainians. And that resulted in great famine, in collectivization, and in, uh, let's say, primitivization of Ukrainian civilization. They called them kohwe. What means koho? Koho, koho means uh, that you are Ukrainian or a laser Russian, and you don't know how to speak literary Russian, so you use the mixture of Ukrainian and Russian, that is haho. And so that's a uh, mixture of Ukrainian and Russian is called surzyk, surzyk. When mixture of Belarusian and Russian is called trasianka. So the Russians do not recognize in official propaganda now the existence of Ukraine as an independent state. Ukrainians are considered ethnic Russians. Although they differ in the dialect of the Russian language, they do not recognize the Ukrainian language as a separate language. Of course, this applies only to those Russians who favor the Kremlin policy. So that doesn't, of course, embrace each Russian person. And the Great Famine, that was in fact not one Great Famine in 1932-33, but three Great Famines in Ukraine. First in 1921-23, the second one, the biggest in the 30s, and after, the last one after the Second World War. In the Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev memoirs, uh, entitled Khrushchev Remembers, he was the general secretary of the Ukraine Republic. He visited this part of Ukraine, around Donetsk and Lugansk during the Great Famine after the war. If you catch this, you can read tragical stories. So according to the various, various estimates, the Holodomor caused the death of about six to 10 million people, of which, of which at least 3,3 million on the territory of the Ukrainian SSSR in the years to, 2147, as a result of three famines, as I mentioned, about 10 million inhabitants of Ukraine lost their lives. So also the same were the victims of uh, collectivizations, processes here. Ho ho, I have mentioned. Ho ho, a contemptuous name for Ukrainian in Russian. is originating from the freak on the head. That's in Ukrainian called the uh, uh, Oseledets. Oseledets in, in uh, it means, of course, the herring, sledge, very often. Um, Surzyk, I have mentioned this uh, mixed uh, Russian Ukrainian. So you can see in, proce in uh, percent how it, how it works, how in different regions of Ukraine. Um, bread or flavor from a, a mixture of different types of grain. That's, that's the, the origin of, of the name Surzyk. So Europe, yeah, Europe, as we know, daughter of Genor was kidnapped by Zeus, who took her to the separate place. And that was the start of our history here. And some drawings of children, Polish and Ukrainian. Maria in U U Ukraine, Ukraine. Maria, that's, that's a dream. Marzenie. These are the posters we can find somewhere here. 30 minutes from Krakow to Ivano Frankowicz, former Stanislavov. And of course, in Polish here, down is written 
between Poland and Ukraine there will be no border. So Ukraine see Ukraine sees its future uh, as a part of Europe. Would it be a good wedding or not? Uh, no one. It's not easy to forecast. We must remember that the Ukrainians are very strong and very hard people, as, as on this photograph, on this drawing, the Ukrainian Cossack. They are not, as the English are used to say, a uh, piece of cake. So Ukrainians are, are not a piece of cake for Europe. 60 nearly, well, now 50, over 50 million people, or around 50 million people, very hard people. And of course, there are such an important person from the today's perspective. So Vladimir Zelensky as the president of Ukraine. I took this photo because this is very sympathetic and at the end uh, to show you the people who are probably the most important for the today's situation in Ukraine concerning, let's say, public image of Ukraine. And these photographs were made by Annie Leibovitz from New York probably the most famous photographer in, in the United States. So that's, that's the end. Thank you very much. And I hope that, <clears throat> that everything was more or less understandable. Thank you. Thanks to you, indeed. I think that for our foreign colleagues here at the faculty, it could have been uh, a bit complicated due to details of our common history, uh, which Poles know and, uh, well, foreigners not necessarily. But please remember that recordings of all lectures are in in principle available on the page of, uh, of the colloquium. Except, except those situations where lecturers clearly uh, deny us the permission to publish the slides or the recordings. So sometimes they are not available, but we shall hopefully have your recordings. Everybody may recall all the details. So now the lecture is open for questions or comments, please. Yes, I, I would have a, maybe maybe two comments later, but one at a time. You mentioned that a Russian has a Byzantine model of uh, rule. I don't think that's uh, precise. That's how Russians present themselves. But uh, they, they have this whole third Rome symbolism. They took uh, language. But if we're talking about their model of rule, they took much more from Mongols and, and, uh, and Kanats that ruled Russia. The true inheritors of Byzantine system of rule uh, were the Ottomans. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, you know, this is the problem to, to, uh, for the larger discussion, because uh, I, to some extent, I accept the Russian point of view that they are the continuators uh, of, the, of the Byzantine Empire. There is an idea of the third Rome, probably you have heard about it, that the, words, the first Rome was the Rome, let's say ancient Rome with the capital in Rome, then was the second Rome the Eastern Roman Empire with the capital in Constantinople. And the third Rome is uh, Russia with the capital in Moscow. And there will be no fourth Rome, so the three Romes. So, so the Russian politicians created the idea that they are continuator of the Byzantine Empire. That's why this uh, eagle with a double head, this Byzantine eagle, that's not the Russian eagle only. So, so but uh, uh, how much, how, uh, how deep are, uh, influences of the Mongol uh, period on the Russian civilization that's still for the discussion. In the, in the 19th century, in the circle of Adam Mickiewicz, when he had his lectures in uh, Sorbonne, in Sorbonne in Paris, uh, there were one lecture was very anti-Russian anti because he uh, mentioned, he was at that moment under a deep influence of, of Andrzej Tauwiański. This, this neo mystical romantic figure. And, and he said that Russians are Mongols, are Mongols in general, and everything was Russian is Mongol. 
And that was, in that moment, was understood as something very accusing and very unsympathetic, or let's say neglecting the position of Russian. And it's still, uh, this lecture is in Russia of Miskevich is, is very uh, condemned. And once I was even a witness of the situation of discussion on the conference about this lecture. So how deep were the influences of Mongols? I don't know. One thing we can uh, admit that from the point of the cruelty of the, of the punishment, and of the, let's say, way of behaving of the Russian army that were from the very beginning of the Imperial Russian army, they were very similar to those practices which were by the Genghis Khan and, and his Tartar tribes. So they're the, the cutting people, um, pouring the people out by two, two horses, putting the people by two horses and so, and, cutting the head and putting on the spears, you know, that, that was, of course, in Ukraine, Ukraine it was also very popular. So the Poles will have been doing such a same, very similar things too. So, and there is no idea that Poles received those meters from Tartars, but that was, let's say, regular, ordinary way of behaving during the war, the war in the 17th century, that you cut the head. I was thinking about economy and mm -hmm. system of rule. Ah, oh, it's uh, difficult to say. I'm, I'm not an expert uh, in this economical thing, so I cannot uh, uh, discuss this problem. But in my <clears throat> opinion, the uh, bureaucratic system of Russia, which was created on the European mode in the 18th century by Peter the Great, so I'm speaking about the first quarter of the 18th century, was uh, made on the example of Prussian, Prussian system. Even the names of the people in the table of ranks were taken straight from the Prussian German system. For, so when you look at the civil rank, they have separate Russian names. But when you look at the mining or army or navy, they have the, exactly the same name as, as the, for example, Stiger or something like Ober, Ober uh, Probierer, such a German names taken straight from the, from the, let's say, mining to Russian mining. So, so more and more connections with Prussian model. The, in the army, in technology, in the civil relations, in the judiciary system, then to the Mongols. So I think that was difficult would be to, 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 to prove that there are the Mongolic influences in Russia. Okay, more remarks. Yeah. I don't want a microphone. Why did you postpone totally in Greek Catholics? Pardon? You postponed totally in your lecture the Greek Catholics. That was a very important feature, uh, mm -hmm. factor and, it, and still is in Ukraine. Uh, great Catholics? Greek, Greek Catholics. Greek. Greek, ah, yeah, you know, because I cannot uh, speak about everything. I, I expected that I will be attacked by not speaking about the Vowin massacre uh, in 1943 or about the UPA and so on. So uh, I didn't mention because in, in general that should be mentioned, you are right. Because in the uh, Brest Union took place in 1596. And that was the moment when the Orthodox hierarchy in Rutenia, in Ukraine, uh, accepted the, uh, let's say, pre, 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 primal position of Pope in Rome. So they, uh, the ceremony, the liturgy, the theology, everything was Orthodox. But one thing has changed the hierarchy of the Orthodox Church accepted Pope. What was the reaction of the, of the, of the Orthodox population of Ukraine? Majority refused. So the bishops were kept and they created the Greek Catholic uh, Church, which was later called the Greek Catholic Church. The majority of, of uh, parishioners and uh, let's say peasants stayed with the orthodoxy in this traditional way connected with Moscow Patriarchy. And that was the start of the religious war in Ukraine, which finally sent, uh, get its peak in, 14, in 1648 during the Khmelnytsky uprising. So that was in fact, at first the in internal war in 
Kingdom of Poland and Lithuania, then was an external war when Moscow started to be involved. So this conflict, as you mentioned, between those Greek Catholics and Orthodox um, resulted in the, in the and probably is the biggest mistake in, in Polish uh, history. Because if we do not uh, make the Brest Union, probably we could uh, make this idea of creating three triple state, Poland, Lithuania, and Ukraine. And the third uh, state would be Grand Duchy of Ruthenia or Grand Duchy of Ukraine, with the capital in Kiev, with the Archangel Michael as a coat of arms. And we had not a double state, but a triple state. And if such a thing would happen, then we, had, we could have not meet with the partitions. But this is, you know, this is futurology from the 16th century. So, so it's difficult. Uh, thank you for, for, for your inter, 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 interesting uh, lecture. I would like to, 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 to ask about the, the Belarus. Thank you. Uh, how Belarus is important for the history of the Ukraine? No, in general, we should mention that in ancient uh, sources, there is no differentiation on Belarus and Ukraine. All those territories are, <clears throat> are defined as a Rutenia. So Rutenia is not only Ukraine, Rutenia is also Belarus. But in fact, if you look from the point of old maps, the terminology, there were a lot of different Rus. There was Białoruś, light, uh, White Russia, and English to, uh, translated as White Russia. It's not White Russia, it's White Rus. Then we have Black Rus. The Black Rus, it's a part of Belarus. That's Grodno. Grodno and surroundings on the west of uh, today's Republic of Belarus, that's Ruscharna, Black Rus. Then we have uh, Red Rus, I've shown you on the slide, uh, around Przemysl between the border. Żółkiew, Żowkwa, and Przemyśl, oh, that's Red Rutenia. Uh, Red Rutenia. So we have many Rutenians. And uh, so Belarus was part of this whole Rutenia. Then started to be uh, differentiated probably also in the Renaissance period, so in the 16th century, because well, that was connected <coughs> with the civilizational. There was a poet's academy, and like, there were also monasteries, there were studies on the Bible and Holy Scripture. So, so the uh, development of Belarus from the point of view of uh, civilization and things connected with orthodoxy was huge. Mm. Uh, when they started to be as a separate. The name Belarus probably also from the 17th century or even from the Middle Ages on the old maps. You can find that uh, uh, White Rutenia or something like that. But uh, they started to use this, use this probably in the 18th century. And, and in general, when the nations started to be created, so in the 19th century, the, the same Polish nation, new modern identity, Ukrainian, Russian, and also Belarusian, but they've been a little late. So they've been a bit late. Ukrainian were, let's say, in the avant-garde of the situation. Ukrainians. Okay, um, maybe the last question, quick one. I don't see any, so I take a privilege maybe to ask <laughs> this quick question. Do you see any real ways of contacting Russian historians on that matter? I mean, apart of those formal, you are a member of uh, very high positioned committees, which were, mm -hmm. uh, for the moment, stopped. I mean, the work has been stopped uh, by the war, but practical terms, private contacts, so do you see any and a mental communication with them, or are they channeled in the official thinking on Ukraine? The problem with Russian academicians is the, probably the same as, as here with the people which are working on your, let's say, discipline. Because as far as we are taking on the private level, face to face, they are quite open and you can discuss with them everything. When, the, when it starts to be, let's say, a changing of letters and even in the emails or official talk by the phone, they 
at the one moment start to uh, change their position on the let's say official one so they start to explain you why the russian approach to ukraine is positive and your polish is negative and so on so in my opinion it's impossible to discuss those problems con concerned with ukraine and now with the russian historians uh, because of the political uh, value, political weight of this topic, and this start to momentarily when you start to discuss, that's the discussion is not academical, start to be political. So, so they never show you what they really think, except the situation when you have Russians here who are, let's say, settled here, who are again. So against Putin and who are against the aggression in Ukraine, then they are open, let's say, you can discuss with them freely. But in every other uh, case, that's impossible. They are all frightened to speak uh, openly, or they really, uh, let's say, support the, the position of Putin and the Kremlin. Thank you.